Uh, so today I'll be speaking a bit about uh, our Goldilocks technology, uh, which is a platform, a LinkedIn-based platform for fuels, chemicals, and materials applications. Uh, the name Goldilocks will hopefully become clear uh, why we selected this name uh, by the end of the talk. If not, uh, I'll explain it at the end. First, uh, we have a short animation uh, about our technology, which also goes into a bit uh, the challenge and solution that we want to address. I hope it works. Society as we know it depends on oil. Not only do we use it as fuel, it's in almost all materials and chemicals we use. But this oil dependency isn't very durable. So, it's time we find an alternative. Something sustainable with similar properties that's abundantly available. The residual stream of paper and bioethanol industries might provide us with just that. Each year they burn 100 million tons of lignin, a perfect replacement for oil. The only issue is that this lignin is a solid material something the oil industry cannot handle, as they are tailored to liquids. The common solution is to cut the large chains of lignin into smaller molecules, turning lignin into a liquid. Unfortunately, this solution doesn't seem economically feasible. That's why Eindhoven University of Technology took a different approach, focusing on what's required instead of what would be the most scientifically appealing. We extract the smaller chains from the lignin stockpile using a variety of solvents, which results in a wide range of liquids, each with their own application in the oil industry. A simple and affordable solution, putting us one step closer to an oil-free world. So I'd, I'd like to, before I go to more details on the technology, comment a bit on, uh, on our position that depolymerization uh, of lignin is not economically feasible. Uh, this comes from our experience in our, in our own uh, internal calculations and our own technology, but also uh, other technologies, because we started on the position we should depolymerize lignin and make monomers. Uh, in fact, our university was competing with all the other universities who can make the most uh, lignin monomers. Uh, uh, but if you uh, work it all out uh, and do all the math and the capex and the opex calculations, it's just very, um, very expensive to do and very costly. And I think two things are important here. One is scale. Uh, so uh, biorefineries by their nature will always have to be relatively small scale relative compared to oil industry. So hundreds, in the order of hundreds of thousands of tons of biomass per biorefinery uh, at, at the most, whereas oil uh, can be in the millions uh, or tens of millions of tons. Uh, so the scale is different, uh, which means if you do something complex like depolymerization at a very small scale in the middle of a forest or in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa, uh, th this is something that you do not see in the fossil world. If that made sense to do complicated chemistry uh, in remote locations at small scales, we would be seeing Shell, Exxon, BP, and these companies doing this as well. Uh, so th this is not happening. That's one reason I don't believe in, um, in depolymerization of lignin directly. Uh, a second reason is that uh, it's been stated in, in many of the talks today that lignin is this fantastic molecule and with all these native properties like uh, antioxidant, uh, UV stabilization, uh, antimicrobial. And if you depolymerize it, you lose uh, especially these high value applications of lignin, which would be in the top of the value pyramid. So this is, uh, these are the two reasons why we do not believe on uh, doing depolymerization directly uh, on lignin, but also directly on, on biomass. Um, on this slide, uh, I have uh, our technology portfolio, uh, which includes uh, IP and also product market combinations, uh, which you saw in the, in the technical animation was our first uh, technology. Uh, here we take biorefinery lignin uh, and subject it, uh, or, or craft uh, lignin works just as fine, is subjected to a, a, therm a thermal sulfolysis uh, reaction, which is essentially 
uh, cooking the lignin uh, in a polar solvent. So it could be methanol, ethanol, phenol, polyols, depends on what we want to make in the end, but I'll get back to that. Uh, at about 200 degrees um, for 10 to 20 minutes, uh, more or less. And what happens there is that at those temperatures and with those solvents, uh, we extract uh, the low molecular weight fractions of lignin. Uh, typically uh, the oligomeric uh, fraction, leaving the higher molecular weight polymeric fraction uh, to be precipitated out as, as char. And for this char, it's not useless. We have projects uh, uh, going using the char as a replacement uh, for coke uh, in, in combustors at industrial sites, as well as asphalt bitumen uh, products uh, as well. Um, I said before, it depends very much on the solvent that we use, which product market application we address. It's been well known and also mentioned here today, I think a couple of times uh, that uh, in phenolic resins, you can use lignin to replace uh, a certain fraction of phenol. Uh, if you talk to phenolic resins manufacturers, however, they're not too keen on the idea of investing in large biomass uh, silos conveyor belts, dispersion systems, uh, etc., in order to accommodate uh, a solid uh, biomass feedstock coming in. Uh, so what we uh, offer them uh, is phenol uh, loaded with whatever percentage of uh, our lignin oligomers they want. Uh, it could be 10, 20, or 50, or even more percent. Uh, this will be a very viscous liquid, but, but still a liquid. It's still something they can use in their existing uh, infrastructure storage and handling systems and also uh, chemical reactors. So for them, it's, it's basically business as usual. Uh, you can compare this approach very much uh, to, uh, to ethanol in the automotive industry. Uh, so when we fill up uh, in Europe on, uh, on gasoline, it contains 10% ethanol. Ethanol is chemically completely different than gasoline, but it gets the job done uh, in the existing hardware without the end user uh, noticing any any difference and also not being uh, forced to pay more at the pump and this is the same proposition we offer to uh, uh, to phenolic resins uh, manufacturers but also polyurethane and we can swap solvents and go to polyol instead and we have liquid polyols with uh, 10 20 whatever percent of uh, these lignin oligomers uh, solubilized in them and bring this uh, liquid blend uh, to a polyurethane producer and then they can go about their business. Uh, the marine fuel is actually very interesting uh, also uh, for us. You always tend to think about marine fuel as a very low value market, but in fact, uh, the benchmarks are these used cooking oil and methyl esters, uh, which sell for north of a thousand euros a ton. Uh, so these would also be prices uh, for most uh, bulk chemicals uh, that we're trying to make from lignin. So in fact, uh, marine fuels is a very interesting uh, market. And in this space, we see Maersk, uh, Danish shipping company, I'll get back to Maersk uh, later, uh, as, as leading. Uh, they announced uh, late last year that, they're, that they plan to sail on a blend of ethanol and solubilized lignin oligomers. Of course, this is uh, exactly what, uh, what we'll be producing. Although uh, my preference would be methanol uh, as a carrier for the marine fuel space. What we recognized uh, going into our pilot phase last year is that while everybody is talking about lignin, it's very difficult to get your hands on tangible amounts of it. Uh, I needed about 10 metric tons uh, for a pilot plant uh, campaign and you cannot imagine how, how difficult it was to secure 10 metric tons of low sulfur lignin. Uh, it was uh, very, very complicated indeed. In the end, we sourced from uh, Remetics, it's a US uh, biorefinery, but it was very complicated. Uh, and then our shareholders got a bit nervous. They said, if it's this difficult to get 10 tons, how are we going to get uh, 10 kilotons or more uh, for, for a demonstration plant or even 100 uh, kilotons for, for a commercial scale plant? And apart from the, the poor availability, it's also pricing. Uh, the prices we're being quoted by companies like uh, Storenzo uh, and, and the like are multiples of uh, what uh, solid biomass would sell for. Uh, so we modified our process a bit uh, to accommodate also lignocellulose as a feed. We keep all process conditions identical, but add an acid, uh, typically four to eight millimoles of sulfuric acid. We can also use other acids. And what happens there is the acid uh, breaks down the lignocellulose matrix uh, in this process 
lignin is liberated uh, uh, in, in the form of uh, oligomers. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, this, uh, these oligomers uh, that are produced are in terms of OH characterization and molecular weight almost identical to the ones that we produce from birefinery lignin. So that's fortunate that we can make, keep our product quite consistent even when switching from lignin to wood as a feedstock. Uh, what happens to the hemicellulose is it breaks down to C5 sugars, which are always methylated for some reason. We're still trying to figure out. Um, these C5 sugars also go to the solvent phase together with the lignin. And uh, the only precipitate uh, that we get uh, is no longer this high molecular weight lignin because we get near full lignin conversion from biomass to the, to the liquid phase. But it's cellulose actually precipitating out. Uh, so the hemicellulose and the lignin go upwards of 90% uh, conversion to the liquid phase, to the solvent. Uh, and then we have uh, nearly fully delignified and dehemicellulosified, if that's a word, cellulose uh, precipitating out. And we can take in different forms of wood. It can be sawdust with chips. Uh, if we've looked basically at, at everything there. Um, and cellulose can, of course, be used for, for ethanol production or, or paper production or various uh, chemicals. Uh, the C5 sugars we can either leave in uh, the, the product oil or take them out. Uh, for the marine fuel application it's not a problem if the sugars are still in. Uh, for polyurethane uh, we're saying uh, we're getting feedback from the industry that uh, too many sugars are a problem. Uh, so we developed uh, an ethyl acetate water extraction uh, a method to get the C5 sugars out uh, of the of the oil phase and into a water phase, and from there we can go to uh, yeah to, to various markets. Uh, downstream, we're also looking at uh, different applications. Uh, we're looking after you remove the solvent, you're left with a thermoplastic uh, soluble oligomeric lignin, which of course can be used as an antioxidant, a lubricity additive, UV stabilizer. Uh, if we leave the oligomers in the solvent, uh, methanol specifically, and we have some IP to feed it into fluid catalytic crackers, as you would find uh, at most uh, oil refineries. There, uh, the methanol converts to, to olefins, as is customary in methanol to olefin chemistry. Uh, in this process, some hydrogen is produced, which allows for efficient cracking of the lignin oligomers down to, uh, to alkylated aromatics like, uh, like BTEX. And we're also developing some IP on, uh, on hydro treating, like catalytic hydro deoxygenation to go to uh, monoalkyl methoxyphenols, uh, which would call lignin monomers. Uh, we already have some IP to go from lignin monomers uh, very selectively to, to phenol. Uh, and I think this covers more or less the, the current uh, IP technology product market combinations. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions I'd be happy to entertain all after the, after the presentation. Uh, looking now at, uh, at our roadmap, uh, we were founded in 2017 as a spin-off company from a public-private partnership between DSM a uh, Dutch chemical company, uh, two Dutch universities and uh, a campus, Brightlands uh, campus in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, at that stage, we were still uh, in the lab, uh, operating a bench uh, reactor, uh, four or five liters. Uh, we then used the pilot plant uh, at the Brightlands campus here, which is a 300 liter batch reactor, to scale up the technology last year, both technologies, so the, the lignin to this oil and also the lignin cellulose to oil. Uh, in parallel, we have a pilot trial running at Iowa State University, uh, where they have a continuous biomass liquefaction unit, uh, which will be used to demonstrate that we can also run the process continuously. Uh, a few weeks ago, we announced a partnership with CCAP, a Swedish bioethanol producer, to run our recipe on their existing steam explosion reactors. Steam explosion and our acid cephalosis are remarkably similar in, in reactor requirements. And so we don't have to do any that serious modifications in order to run our recipe at the demo plant, which will give us a quick route uh, to, to a higher TRL, a TRL boost at uh, little to no cost. Um, what I'll show in the next slide is that with CCAP and, and others, we're preparing a BPI flagship uh, proposal to be submitted in September uh, this year uh, to go to the next step, which will be uh, a 10 
plus kiloton. We're still debating about the exact scale uh, facility. Uh, and for this, uh, I would like uh, to take the opportunity uh, to invite you all, if you have an idea how your company uh, or research institute uh, might be a possible partner in this consortium, uh, yeah, please, please let me know. Uh, it will look a bit like this. So all the logos that are in uh, now have already committed uh, to join the project. Uh, what we will do is we will convert uh, both technical lignans from pulp and paper as well as biorefineries uh, together with lignin-rich residual streams that are now burnt. Yeah, think about sawdust, uh, coffee grounds, uh, nutshells. Uh, so uh, we're only looking at biomass that is now burnt, uh, technical lignans or, or lignin cellulose streams. We then used the uh, CCAP uh, reactor technology along with our cephalosis and acid cephalosis technologies uh, to scale up, uh, to, to demo scale, uh, 10 plus kilotons, as I mentioned uh, before. Uh, to produce uh, this Goldilocks. Uh, Goldilocks uh, are these solvent soluble thermoplastic lignin oligomers. Uh, and from there, we, we try to build the value pyramid. Uh, right now, it's uh, destined for, for power and heat, and this is the bottom of the value pyramid. Uh, you go one step up, uh, you already increase the value five to tenfold uh, in, in transportation fuels, uh, the second generation variety of which sell for north of a thousand euros a ton. So this is already a very interesting uh, market and a huge value increase for a relatively simple product uh, to produce. Here we have Merska, Danish shipping company as a, as a partner. On the chemicals and materials side, one step higher, we have a Dutch uh, company, BioBTX. Uh, which uh, will look at the char that we produce as a source of, uh, of BTX for the fast pyrolysis uh, process. But we'll also be looking in the, uh, to convert end-of-life pr plastics produced by BSF containing our lignin oligomers uh, as a feedstock for this BTX. Uh, we have a Spanish partner, Inresmat, which is making polyurethane construction materials like door frames, window frames. Uh, all the way on the top, we have LignoPure, a uh, German SME uh, specialized in lignin application development. Uh, they'll be doing uh, work on cosmetics uh, mainly. Think of uh, sunscreen, uh, for instance, and uh, various gels. Uh, we're still looking for a food and feed partner, but also for other potential partners uh, in, in the value pyramid steps that already contain, uh, contain some work. We could always use, uh, use more uh, to build the case. We're also uh, still looking for lignin suppliers, uh, additional lignin suppliers to come into the market. Uh, it can be SMEs, can be industrial uh, uh, parties, uh, can be in the pulp and paper space or the biorefinery space, uh, um, uh, entertaining all options at this time. Anything that strengthens the consortium and increases our chances uh, uh, is a win and should be, uh, should be considered. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to conclude and entertain any questions you might have at this point. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.